How Israel Destroyed the Iraqi Nuclear Reactor Israel has nothing to apologize for. We decided to act now. In the summer of 1981, Israeli bombs destroyed the Iraqi nuclear reactor in Altuvajda. The Israelis alone, among its allies, would not wait with folded arms until dictator Hussein had a nuclear weapon at his disposal. This prevented Saddam Hussein from working on a nuclear weapon for a long time. In this video, we will take a closer look at the incredible air raid story when Israel destroyed the Iraqi nuclear reactor and also on their cooperation with Iran. Israel had long been purchasing aircraft of American origin, supplemented by its own versions of those components that the U.S. Department of Defense did not release for export. This purchase mainly concerned avionics and electronic warfare devices. In connection with the supply of new Soviet equipment, including MiG-25s to the Arab states, Israel began to look for appropriate counterweapons. In the mid-1970s, a group of Israeli pilots took part in comparative tests of several new aircraft. Despite efforts to reduce armaments spending and save a tight budget, the purchase of a powerful F-15 Eagle was approved. But even the powerful F-15 was not an ideal machine. The raid on the reactor was feasible only with conformal fuel tanks, which contained another 3,214 liters of fuel. The problem was that at the time the raid was first considered, there were no conformal fuel tanks in Israel. They were part of the contracts for 1979 and the first four sets only arrived from McConnell Douglas in 1980. In addition, the F-15 was a machine for fighting air supremacy. Its ability to attack ground targets was limited. Unlike the F-4, it was not equipped to carry a laser target marker. True, it could carry smart bombs, but other aircraft would have to illuminate the target. The question was, which aircraft should do that? Fortunately for Israel, a solution to the tricky situation was already looming. After Israel signed the agreements at Camp David and subsequently the peace treaty with Egypt, a fundamental change took place. The United States, specifically the administration of President Jimmy Carter, approved the sale of F-16 aircraft under the Peace Marble One program. The first package ordered included 75 single-seat F-16As and eight two-seat F-16Bs. The Israelis were on the F-16 line behind Iran, but after the fall of the regime of Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, U.S.-Iranian relations cooled sharply. The Israelis thus fell into the lap of a blessing in the form of 47 free F-16As and 8 F-16Bs. Some of these aircraft belonged to the older production Block 5, but before delivery to Israel, they were upgraded to Block 10. The first F-16 arrived in Israel in July 1980, and the first unit to receive them was the 117th Squadron, Hasilon HaRishon, translated to English as First Jet Squadron at the base of Ramat David, near Haifa. It was followed by the neighboring 110th Squadron, Abare HaSafon, Knights of the North, sharing a common base. The 117th Squadron reached full operational capability on November 21, 1980. The retraining of the pilots was fast, although not without accidents. On January 20, 1981, an F-16 collided with an F-4 in the air. F-16 pilot Rav Seren Ehud bin Amite was killed. On the other hand, on April 28th of the same year, Skan Aluf Ze'ev Raz, commander of the 117 Squadron, opened a score of F-16 aircraft over Lebanon by shooting down a Syrian Mi-8 helicopter. Meanwhile, a blow came from where almost no one expected it. The Iraqi army, in a force of six divisions with the support of about 3,000 tanks, crossed the border with its neighbor Iran on September 22. The Air Force attacked Iranian military bases in order to destroy the Air Force on the ground. Iran feared Iraq's nuclear reactor as much as Israel feared it. Setting aside the false promises of the Iraqi Prime Minister, Iran did not intend to take any risks. One week after the outbreak of war, four Iranian F-4 Phantom IIs appeared over Baghdad from Noja base. Each aircraft carried six low-drag general-purpose bombs and two guided missiles for self-defense. Phantoms rushed in at a low altitude. They flew through the Iraqi radar screen and completely surprised the anti-aircraft defense, which did not even manage to fire. The whole attack was very fast and professionally executed. In front of Baghdad, the formation split. One pair bombed an electrical substation supplying Baghdad. 
the other attacked the Altuvashta complex. The Phantoms gained altitude four kilometers before the target and dropped one row of bombs from the dive. They were less than 10 seconds above the target. The bombs hit the reactor building, but witnesses observed how they bounced off the dome, while delayed explosions hit other objects. Incredible as it may seem, both Iran and Israel felt so threatened by Iraq's nuclear program that their secret services cooperated, despite some irreconcilable differences. It is likely that the results of the raid were passed on to Israeli agents and subsequently to the planner Shel Ha'avir. Although Iraqi propaganda vehemently claimed that the bombing was inaccurate, Iraq eventually admitted $7 million in damage and delayed the entire program. There was one lesson for the Israelis. Heavy pieces needed to be loaded. Another benefit was that Iraq's air defenses refocused in the direction from which the threat came. The downside was that the defense was further strengthened. In the end, a diverse set of missile armament awaited the Israeli pilots. Starting with armored self-propelled anti-aircraft guns ZSU-234 using onboard radar to the infamous anti-aircraft missile 2K-12 Cub. The final decision to bomb the reactor was made on October 29, 1980. The top secret operation was named OPERA. Twelve of the most experienced pilots from the 117th and 110th squadrons were selected. Eight of them were to take part directly in the raid. Four were deputies. Both squadron commanders personally participated in the raid. The youngest participant in the mission was Ilan Ramon, 26 at the time of the raid. This man later became Israel's first astronaut. He died on February 1, 2003, in the crash of the Space Shuttle Columbia. Although the F-16 was a qualitatively new aircraft, the reach of the mission was at its limit. But there was too much at stake. The most critical situation concerned the fuel. For the event, a maximum flight altitude of 50 meters and a flight speed of 665 kilometers per hour were set, a setting at which the General Electric jet engines had the lowest consumption. Each aircraft carried a full set of three additional tanks two with 1,400 liters under the wings and one with a volume of 1,135 liters under the fuselage, replenishing the basic supply of 4,060 liters of fuel in integral tanks. Nevertheless, every liter had to be saved as much as possible. The possibility of refueling aircraft with a running engine, called hot refueling, was practically verified. Thanks to this, another 700 liters of fuel were added into the fuel system, which represented about 15 minutes of flight. The aircraft was refueled at the pre-takeoff line. The regulation on the F-16 forbade the dumping of empty additional fuel tanks if the hangars are under the wings. This is due to a possible collision of empty tanks with suspended ammunition. The pilots of Shell Javier verified that the tanks passed the bombs at a sufficient distance. It was therefore possible to discard the empty tanks and thus get rid of unnecessary drag. Based on the evaluation of the data on the Iranian air raid, the Israelis decided not to leave anything to chance and use a proper caliber. For the raid, one 2,000-pound, 907-kilogram bomb was mounted under each wing of the F-16, supplemented by guided missiles at the ends of the wings. Ultimately, the F-16 carried so much armament and fuel that the takeoff weight by more than a ton exceeded the allowable limit. It was to be bombed from a dive flight from a height of 1,500 meters at an angle of 38 degrees. The height for the throw was set at 1,200 meters. The bomb thus landed on the dome at a steep angle of about 66 degrees and did not tend to bounce. In addition, it was ensured that the fragments would not hit the carrier. For maximum bursting effect, the bombs had a delay detonation to explode inside the building. Sufficient accuracy of bombing was ensured by the F-16 weapon computer, enabling bombardment by the computed impact point method, which displays a continuously calculated point of impact on the heads-up display. The probable circular deviation from the target is given to 12 meters. In the event that the Iraqi Air Force intervened in the action, F-16 pilots practiced escape maneuvers with afterburning switched off. Israel has no common border with Iraq and had need to disrupt Saudi Arabia's airspace. Information about the Arab air defense was actively collected by pilots of the 119th Squadron, armed with F-4 Phantom aircrafts. The aircraft searched for holes in Saudi Arabia's early warning system and measured the range and resolution of surveillance radars. The date of the attack was definitively chosen on Sunday, June 7, 1981. The strike group consisted of two squadrons of four F-16s. 
The first formation of the F-16, originally Block 5, was assigned to the 117th Squadron and was given the call sign of Ismail for the operation. The second group consisted of F-16 Block 10 from the 110th Squadron and their call sign was Eskol. The escort consisted of three pairs of F-15 aircraft from the 133rd Squadron, packed with fuel and weapons. In addition to the internal stock of 5,260 liters, they carried the conformal fuel tanks with a capacity of 3,211 liters and three additional tanks with a capacity of 2,270 liters each. For air combat, they had a full set of four semi-active guidance missiles and four Israeli Shafrir missiles with passive infrared guidance. The calling signs of the pairs were Patel, Patefon, and Pakman. The event was commanded by Moshe Melnik, Patel 01, commander of the 133rd Squadron. He chose Benny Zinker as his wingman. Moshe flew with Yer Rachmelovic in the back seat. The two-seater version was chosen to give Moshe the opportunity to devote more time to the command itself. In the second pair was another double-seater, piloted by Mickey Lev, Potiphon 01. This aircraft was to ensure the transmission of information about the outcome of the raid. The radio operator in the back seat was Aluf Mishneh Abiyam Sela, one of the planners of Operation Opera. The third full-fledged colonel involved in the operation was the leader of the third formation of F-15, Aluf Mishneh Eitan Ben Eliyahu, whose back was guarded by wingman Yoram Paled. Ben Eliyahu almost had to cancel his involvement in the raid because his F-15 had serious issues with its fuel system. All F-16 aircrafts flew to the Etzion base, which was close to the target, on Friday, June 5th. Israel was to return this occupied base on the Sinai Peninsula to Egypt in 1982. To support the whole event, four F-15 were prepared, patrolling the Dead Sea and monitoring the activity of the Jordanian Air Force. Furthermore, a refueling aircraft KC-135 and another Boeing 707 aircraft were prepared, serving as a flying command post and retransmission station. At the briefing, the commander of the formation, Ze'ev Raz, did not hide from his pilots what they were getting into. We will not have enough fuel. Whoever gets involved in a duel will not get home. Also, the instructions for what they had to do were clear. You would bomb at five second intervals. We drop a total of 16 bombs. Eight hits are enough to destroy the target. The event started at 1555. The takeoff was not without its problems. Amir Nahumi had to take one of the four replacement aircraft because his original F-16 broke down. Another victim was Relik Shafir, whose fuel gauge began to strike during hot refueling and kept falling, even though technicians filled the tanks to the brim. There was no time to change the plane, so he just waved his hand and continued with takeoff. The planes gradually detached from the tanking stations with 300 meter intervals and they took off. Although the aircrafts were overloaded, the pilots had to take off without the use of additional combustion to save fuel. Only after reaching a speed of 80 knots, 150 kilometers per hour, they could use an afterburner for a short time to get into the air. After detaching and reaching a speed of 190 knots, 350 kilometers per hour, they turned off the afterburner, and by the end of the flight, they had to forget that it existed if they wanted to return home. The aircraft took a free formation at an altitude of 730 meters, made a turn to the left, and flew across the Gulf of Aqaba into the airspace of Saudi Arabia. There were thousands of tourists by the sea who could not see or hear the formation. In addition, a Jordanian royal yacht with a monarch on board was moored in the bay. However, the alleged phone call of the King Hussein, who immediately guessed where the planes were going and called the Iraqi air defense, is just a nice fairy tale. The planes descended to a height of 50 meters and continued for 80 minutes at a speed of 0.7 Mach above the desert towards Baghdad, in complete radio silence and with radars on to spare load. Attracting the attention of the Saudi Royal Air Force's E-3A Sentry aircraft with unnecessary radioactivity was the last thing the Israelis would hazard. Additional fuel tanks were thrown away by the pilots individually, so they remained scattered for many kilometers. Resistance, and thus the consumption of the F-16, dropped significantly. The speed slowly rose to 0.8 Mach. <laughs> Shortly afterwards, they flew into Iraqi airspace. 40 kilometers before Baghdad, F-15 and F-16 pilots turned on their radars and began searching for the enemy. 
של איזה שיר של חברים, של F-16, סליחה. לא להיבהל. After flying over the river Euphrates, the F-15 formation split. The Pakman pair patrolled to the west, Potiphon to the southwest of the target. Patel circled over air bases around Baghdad and finally covered the offensive formation. <laughs> Ten minutes before the target, Ze'ev Raz checked the position according to the cities of Al Mard and Al Rahalia. Shortly afterwards, the F-16's main fuel tanks were dropped and continued only with bombs. Just before crossing the Tigris River, the formation commander broke the radio silence for the first time to warn the others of the high voltage line. Seven kilometers before Al Tuvajta, aircrafts began to rise sharply to a height of 3,000 meters. At the top of the climb, they turned on their backs and the pilots began searching for the reactor dome. Then they turned around and plunged headlong into the target. The first F-16 struck at 1735. The time of the strike was chosen so that virtually no one was in the area. In addition, the planes attacked with the bright evening sun in the back, causing difficulties for the Iraqi air defense. Ismail was the first to drop bombs. The very first pair of Mark 84s pierced the reactor dome. Other pilots followed at five second intervals. The bombs exploded inside the building, so the second formation had to aim at a cloud of smoke and dust. Of the 16 bombs dropped, 14 hit the building. The target was not hit by Yiftak Spector, who missed the entry point. Two of the drop bombs failed to explode. One was found in a connecting tunnel between the reactor building and the plutonium treatment plant. The reactor building was destroyed. Total loss of life. 10 Iraqi soldiers and one French civilian, engineer Damon Chassoupiet, but those were just direct losses. After the raid, Saddam Hussein gave the order to shoot the commander of air defense and several other officers of the rank up from the major. Another 23 people ended up in prison. During the air raid, the Iraqi air defense response was slow. The whole raid lasted 45 seconds and permission to fire rocket batteries was issued centrally from Baghdad. Verification and response took two minutes at best. The planes were bothered only by not very accurate firing of the barrel weapons. Two F-16s suffered minor damage. After the call, all the pilots reported the code word Charlie, which meant that they had bombed properly. <laughs> Se'ev Raz sent an Everybody Charlie acknowledgement via Lev's F-15, which was intercepted by the crew of the Boeing 707 Command. Okay. In the video from the bombing, we see the beginning of the ascent, hear warnings about dragging, twisting over the target, continuously calculated point of impact and focus of the target, then the moment of drop, explosion, roll away from the target, and detonation of deceptive targets. The pilot's heavy breath can be heard as well. Now there was a way home. The F-16 had already consumed two-thirds of its fuel. Therefore, they climbed to a height of 11,500 meters to reduce consumption. The accompanying F-15s were still guarding them a thousand meters higher. On the way back came congratulations from Commander Chel Havir and a wish, now you just have to land. At 1900, the F-16 landed at the Etzion base, practically with dry tanks. The fullest fuel remained for 15 minutes of flight. The accompanying F-15 returned to the parent base of Tel Nav and were not much better with fuel. The operation ended, and with it, Saddam's ambitions to obtain plutonium for nuclear weapons. The reaction of world politicians, led by the Soviet Union and the League of Arab Countries, was almost hysterical. France and other countries joining. The UN Council issued Resolution 487, condemned the raid. Israel has nothing to apologize for. We decided to act now, before it is too late. That we shall defend our people with all the means at our disposal. Although American diplomacy supported the resolution, they managed to veto all proposals for sanctions when the hype surrounding the raid erupted. The whole event looked completely different less than 10 years later. Israel's moderate stance on the rocket bombing of its territory by Iraq was partly influenced by the knowledge that they did not carry nuclear warheads. On October 1991, 
U.S. Secretary of State Dick Cheney officially thanked Israel for the action.